Hi everyone, I am Matteo Collina and today I'm going to talk to you about community frameworks because yes, in the JavaScript community we really like frameworks and maybe a little bit of my personal history. Um, well, probably not, you don't care, but I think that I have, I have a story to tell. Anyway, uh, if you have some time, please follow me on Twitter. It's, you know, I tweet about open source things and JavaScript, so yeah, maybe you will find it interesting. So let's let's jump into it. Uh, long time ago, I was I wanted to be a, an open source developer, and you know it was and I tried very hard, and I built uh, things with Ruby, with CoffeeScript, with Node.js, JavaScript. I, you know, I was. Uh, I tried very much, and I tried very much to become an open source developer. I, I really wanted, I really, really wanted to do it. And yeah, I don't know, I don't know, it didn't go, uh, it didn't go really well. Um, you know, it's one of the key things that I wanted to do was to build uh, open source to help other developers uh, build, uh, build amazing things. And yeah, this was one of the greatest stuff that, you know, I wanted to, I really felt I wanted I wanted to do this, and I wanted to help others, other developers building building in software, and probably don't feel as miserable as I felt when I started and so on. Well, I don't know, something like that. Uh, a little bit of the of success came when I uh, built uh, Mosca in more or less 2013 at that point in time i was i was doing my i was doing my phd and um, essentially it's uh, as part of my phd i was researching things on the internet of things and i needed a very flexible mqtt broker mqtt is you know a fantastic project check out node red as well so hey um, we are part of the same kind of family and uh, when uh, when I was developing this this broker, uh, you know, I I made uh, a few mistakes. Uh, the first one was uh, it was a completely uh, unmaintainable, uh, uh, really unmaintainable uh, architecture internally. I made some mistakes. I didn't know how to structure a large and successful uh, Node.js application back then. Um, it's also uh, I never spent enough time in in automation and in making sure CI was uh, stable. And this was actually really problematic, especially if you're building a distributed system, working in distributed systems. This is really really critical. I didn't uh, uh, spend uh, any effort in building a community of maintainers. I wanted to retain ownership of, of the project. And uh, however, it, uh, um, it it really got some nice traction, and it uh, and with it there was a, I don't know maybe I can I thought well you know even though I did this as part of my PhD maybe I can make some money out of it you know I can help me it can help me grow in my career. Uh, however, I had no real funds. Uh, I didn't want to raise much uh, was not much of venture capitalist in Italy back then not that there is much now but a little bit things a little bit better and uh, um, the project essentially failed it was a galactic failure for for a few reasons well um, the main reason was that you know I built a, a monster and this monster was as too many dependencies really too many it was doing too many things. It was not modular. It was not. It had no community, and I thought it was, um, it was a hero. Uh, I was a hero, and I could actually develop and maintain this software and make it great. Which turns out the case that's not how open source. Uh, that's not how open source work, and you know, that's it. So, what can we say? I also. Add a few different things in uh, in this. One is uh, some company, which I'm not going to name on this talk, took uh, my software, uh, paired it with some other software, 
uh, and of some really, really good uh, developer living in London and some other software from another great developer living in the US. And they cook it map together. They change the names, which the color. So it moved from being a front color to being another color. And it, they packaged it up and sold it to a very, very large company for tens of millions. And none of the three people that I mentioned uh, actually made any money about this. Yeah, this didn't really go well for my uh, for my for for myself really. Uh, in fact, uh, whenever this niche was developing and when it was um, uh, cre starting to develop some of the uh, some of you know the project was growing a little bit and it had a community. It started to have the beginning of a community maybe. Uh, people you know uh, started complaining with me and they started saying well i'm going to stop using this your library because you're not fixing this bug this was actually really really bad and it was like it felt really bad i don't know i felt bad i was like i was completely and utterly destroyed by by that uh, by that sentence which is very strange right why well you know um why nobody is appreciating what I'm doing? Why they're not, they're not, you know. I try to help the community. I try to help people. Why I'm not, you know, being successful at all. Uh, well, and then I started following in, 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 in a bad trap, which is mostly called the imposter syndrome. Um, you know, in, in many challenges, we can be personal, profession, professional. We are held back by... The crippling thought that uh, uh, people like us could not be successful, and you know, it's I thought you know other people can do it because they are special or great and essentially better than me because of whatever, and you know, that's kind of what happened. And in fact, the reality is that you know. There's any of that there's not there's not such a thing uh you can know something you can have something to say in the world even if and that's probably not what other people have something to say in the world so there's no um there's no such thing as imposter syndrome so well there's such thing as imposter syndrome but you know you're not an imposter believe in yourself um in fact um you know, the key thought that resonated well with me was um, I started asking myself the question if was, I was just building software for myself. And this was, you know, who uh, am I doing this software for? Well, I'm not, you know, it's just, I want to improve the experience for other people, others. I want others to enjoy my software. So it's uh, it's really, really tricky. And it comes for with a larger responsibility, to be honest, um, because there's a lot of other things that, um, you know, are required for open source to be successful. You need a product strategy. You need documentation. You need to have a developer experience on the product. For developers that are contributing to the project itself, you need to have a release strategy. You need to have long-term support, semantic versioning, a lot, a lot of things. Uh, people really like 1.0.0, by the way, um, and 2.0.0. Uh, you need to have licensing. Uh, you need to have reliable tooling, tooling, including CI. You need to have you know, some form of outreach and promoting the project. And you need to provide some support for your user. So, yeah. Um, uh, the problem is that there was no chance, there's no chances that you can do all of that alone. Okay? I don't want to be delusional, but it's essentially too much work if somebody wants to do it only, and I say only, on their uh, on their own. So uh, and with no money. And yeah, well, you know, apparently I was a fool, and you know there was zero chances i don't know what to say but that's the that's the reality so um one of the things that 
that you want to do is you might want to think, well, I'm, I just, I can just do a startup. I want to do a startup to uh, convert to uh, to make sure that the uh, my my project is safe, and by creating a um, an economical a, a company behind it, I can make sure that it's safe and successful. Well, you know, having a successful startup is hard. Doing a successful open source project is hard. Having a successful startup around open source is even harder. And remember that any cloud provider can compete with you tomorrow. And that's actually a very, 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 very big problem. So, because they have unlimited resources, essentially. So, well, the question that you want to ask is that if there is another way, is there another way where you can target, when you can be successful and create something? Well, you know, um, Turns out there is, and an open source project is as good as, its com as it is its community, which is really, 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 really critical. So the only thing you need to, if you, are, if you care about your open source project and if you want to build an open source project, you only need to care about your community. Who is your community? Who are you talking to? That's what you should care about and where you should talk to. So, well, let's see. Let's try again. Let's tell another story. And let's see what can do we can do differently now. Okay, so back in 2013, at this exact same time when I was developing um, Mosca, I also built another product, another library called LevelGraph. I don't know, you probably don't remember this. You shouldn't, okay? Uh, the type of research that I've done in the, for developing this thing ended up spread it around the world for other interesting things. So... I don't care. Uh, but what happened is that this is level graph was a nice graph database built on top of uh, level up, which is a wrapper for level db. By the way, level up is phenomenal. You should check it out. Okay, and this is all of this is developed in the level community, which is a community first and then a collection of module seconds for creating transparent databases. Note that in November 2022, which is sounds a really long time ago at this point, uh, Rod Rod Vag um, uh, wrote about open open source, and and he stated that individuals making significant and valuable contributions are giving the commit access to the project to contribute as they see fit. This is critical. This is how you grow a community. This is how you open it up and you enable others to join the project. Uh, in fact, it's uh, th that has put in the seed for uh, open governance and the Node.js way. In fact, in, uh, uh, in Node.js, a collaborator is responsible as commit access to Node.js node and it's, uh, um, they, maintain co they collectively maintain uh, Node.js. However, every collaborator can nominate somebody else. So, and nominee and the, the nominees uh, should have significant and valuable contributions across the Node.js organization. Those are two excerpts from the Node governance. The Node governance is such a big file, so you should, you might want to, um, you might want to check it out and and read a little bit more. But it's actually very an interesting read, and it's also really really fascinating. So let's keep going and see where we are. Um, now, if I am going to be asked the, to, to receive this question now, after seeing all of this, and, um, and after knowing where a, what a good community of users uh, is, when somebody tells me that they're going to stop using my library because uh, they're not, uh, I'm not fixing a bug, well, there is uh, only one answer to them, and it's thank you. Please stop. Uh, it's really, really better if you use something else. And the reason is is that they don't, you don't want to be feel to felt pressures in helping them, and they don't want to be part of a community. They just want to free be. They just want free be, really. 
And, well, everybody likes free beer, but there's no such thing as free beer to some extent. Somebody is, is paying for it. So you don't want, you really, really need to, to do this. And um, they're not really useful. So, by the way, don't be that person, okay? Really, don't be that person. Let me, let me, let me repeat this. Don't be the person that asks for a fix on a library without being willing to contribute any time into fixing that bug yourself. It might be that you need to contribute um, a very well written script to reproduce the problem or you know, spend time to actually fix the bug yourself, but you need to help. Okay? Be a very good citizen of open source. So um, let's keep going. And, um, and you know, it, it's, even though I got involved in, in several successful open source projects, it's still sticking to my hem, into my mind on how can I build a successful and launch a successful open source, open source project myself. Um, first of all, you need, to, I want, you need to scratch your own inch. You need to be able, you need, you know, you need to build something that you have uh, you some unique perspective and you want to need to be have something to say on that specific field. The second bit is that you want to be able to attract people that are interested in solving the same problem and then build something together and chain ownership. And, you know, it's, uh, it's all about community, folks. So, you know, that's it. Ooh. Ah, sorry, folks, you know. So let's keep going and talk about uh, my experience. So, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in 2016, I was, um, in 2016, I was, I was in London and um, uh, it was St. Valentine's Day. I was on a business trip. My fiancé was not really happy about it, to be honest. But, you know, it was, it was a business trip and I, was, I had dinner with my colleagues and after that, we spent the night coding uh, a flinger tool. Hi, Dave. Hey, miss you. So, um, in fact, and, and I found my niche, okay? And I call it the, the adapter problem. Now, this is a piece of paper, right? And with a piece of paper, you know, you can, uh, you know, you can only fold uh, a piece of paper so many times, okay? Like, I don't know, I keep folding my piece of paper, but, you know, there is only a limited amount of time where I can fold it, because after a while, I cannot fold it anymore, you see? It's too hard. And the problem with, the, with this is that uh, you can only have so many abstractions before... Uh, your code becomes extremely slow. And I got focused, I focused myself and I focused my career on improving performance of Node.js and Node.js applications. So uh, one of the first things that I built is Pino, which is a, a really nice logger. And wow, it's, you know, it took the, I presented it at a nice conference in San Francisco, then at a bunch of other events, uh, somebody dedicated a poem to me and Dave, which is the other author of Pino. Thank you, Emily. It was a greatest moment and of, of Node.js lore. And in fact, in uh, uh, the, the, the key moment where things changed was when I started to ask a, 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 you know, a stranger, would you like to help maintain Pino? This was one of the um, greatest moments because they said yes. And first of all, I met a friend, which was, you know, something that probably a life, hopefully a, a lifelong friend. But, you know, we have been chatting and working together for the last few years. And, uh, he, um, you know, he has been, uh, thanks to Pino and thanks to... Um, thanks to Pino, he went, thanks to working in open source, he was able to change jobs, change job, change life. He uh, increased his salary significantly, so hey. Um, but it was kind of a big surprise. And 
I have seen it firsthand how op helping people, helping open source and building a community and being part of a community can help somebody's career and can change somebody's life. So this is one of the greatest things that I think I am proud of. So, uh, you know, Pino is, uh, is now very successful, is the fastest longer for Node.js, and it has very minimal features, so don't expect much, but it has a great community. And it's right now downloaded maybe 4 million times per month, which is, you know, pretty successful to some extent from my point of view. It has four active collaborators, and it has now reached version 6. Hey, successful library. Um, so, next, I started asking myself a nice question is uh, how can I build a new web framework for Node.js? Well, why do I want to build a web framework? Because I was not really um, happy about the performance of, uh, of Node.js applications. And uh, I was doing some benchmarkings and a lot of consulting, and turns out that there was some lot of time spent in Node in inside the Node.js framework and inside Node modules and inside libraries in there, and I wanted to fix that because most of the time, uh, the CPU time should be spent in running a uh, business code, is running your the developer's application. The framework should not be in the way to gather to gather good performance. So uh, this time, I didn't want to be a fool. And in fact, I didn't want to, uh, I knew I couldn't do that all alone. I actually, I've learned my lesson. So I started, uh, I want, I really needed to build a community because this was, a, it's a gargantuan work. Like shipping a new web framework is gargantuan. And I really wanted to build, a, and I really wanted to build a community. So, um, the first thing that I started is I uh, I didn't want to start developing the framework up until I could have find another human being that would have been interested in the journey, in sharing the journey with me and building with me together. Um, now, this has been one of the founding moment of uh, for me because I was saying, I basically said, well, the, the open source, the code matters so little in what I want to build that I'm going to focusing on convincing somebody else. Right about that time, I uh, ended up. Um, I was doing a, a Node.js workshop, a Node training uh, in Italy, and one of the attendees of my class asked. Hey, Matteo, uh, I would like to get started in open source. And I didn't. I said, well, wh where do I start? Where do I want to, what, want to do? And then how can I do it? And then I said, well, I don't know. Um, I'm working, I would like to start working on a new, on a new web framework for Node.js to solve all these problems that I'm seeing on the, on the others. And he said, oh, interesting and then we started working together and we started um, developing software together and we were chatting every every few days we started tinkering we spent long nights maybe uh, uh, doing stuff and well all remotely by the way all on github and uh, pushing things whenever we could um, I helped him find his next two jobs so again I'm feeling very very proud and yeah, um, so hmm, it went it went really really well. Um, so anyway, let's go and start about the genesis of of, of a framework. And uh, it's it's really um, that's what led to uh, uh, Fastify. And Fastify is the framework with myself and Thomas uh, de la Vedova uh, built together, and what we have started. First of all, it's based on open governance. In fact, it was from the start, it was never to be my own thingy. Okay, it's a shared thingy. Uh, it's not my project. It's our project. Um, I uh, I probably had the idea and some of the founding moments, but it's it's not mine. I'm not the first contributor of the project. Okay, to be clear, 
Thomas is. I am not. And it's community first. We welcome first-time contributors. In fact, we want to grow our community of collaborators. So if you want to join and want to contribute to a nice open source project, please come. We have a lot of things to do, really. A lot of open issues. <laughs> um, it's also based on the concept of shared ownership. So if uh, we don't want to be in a position of you asking us for, a fi for, for fixing a bug. We want you to fix your own bugs. Okay? And that's how we grow our community. So that's, that's, this is everybody's frameworks. So everybody needs to contribute. It's also based on some few very important technical details. So first of all, we didn't want to have much overhead in production. Now, you can have, you need to have some because it's just clear. It's not Rust, okay? Where it has zero overhead abstractions. But you can do pretty good things with Node.js. So you can actually have very little overhead. We want to have a good developer experience. We wanted to work both for small and big projects. So, you know, uh, individual developers as well as big companies. And which should work well for both. And so it can be something that I can learn on my own and then use it at, at work whenever I get the chance. Um, and it should be able to easy to migrate to microservices or serverless and back. So we needed to support both monoliths and monoliths and microservices and be able to use both to migrate to both models very quickly without needing to rewrite the full code base essentially. Uh, you need to to have a good security model and uh, have a good security security reporting uh, security reporting. And by the way, thanks OpenJS, thanks Node.js for 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 providing this. Um, it uh, uh, it's based on the concept of plugins. So if something could be a plugin, it likely should. So we created an open core system where uh, it's highly extensible, even though it's you know cost free. Uh, those mechanisms are cost free, and um, it's highly extensible. You can plug in and add things in several places of the framework and customize it the way you want, so that you can develop your own plugins and tune it to be the what you need on your project. It's also easily testable, uh, uh, and so code bitten in Fastify is easily testable. It has a nice dot inject function, which is fantastic. And uh, and then it's, uh, um, uh, we didn't want to do any monkey patching of core, uh, of Node.js core. That is one of both of my main critics for a lot of frameworks, so no monkey patching, sorry. Uh, you need to support semantic versioning and have long-term support strategy, and it should, you know, adhere to HTTP 1.1. Um, so uh, Fastify was then born, and it's right now one of the fastest web frameworks for Node.js. It's uh, it has ten active contribute collaborators, and it has you know now reached version three. It's no, it's in release candidate stage as the time of this talk. So hey. And uh, uh, it has now an ecosystem of 140 plugins. And it's actually very easy and fun to use. So please, you know, check it out. Um, I just want to uh, say a few parting words, which is uh, uh, people use software I built. And uh, there have been some some and in part from some great communities node.js pino fastify and you know in 2020 modules that i maintain will be downloaded around 5 billion times which is a little bit staggering to be honest and um uh, with this i want to say thank you uh thank you for your time and uh, uh please uh check us out um Nearform is a professional services company based in Ireland. We do all things JavaScript, so if you need any help with Node or React or whatever, just hook us in and we can probably help you. And I just want to say uh, thank you for uh, coming to my talk. And uh, um, I hope the story was nice and uh, you and you enjoyed and you enjoyed it. And see you next time. Bye bye.